Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. In this episode, I talk with Sarah Villafranco about how she went from being an ER doctor to growing her own soap and skincare company. We talk about fear and trust in business and the beauty and complexity of aging. Welcome to this week's episode of the Flower Lounge. This week, I am very excited to have with us Dr. Sarah Villafranco. She is founder and CEO of Osmia Organics. She has a natural skincare company that I just love, um, and she's a, she's a skincare expert and a noisy advocate for cultivating joy and health every day. What you may not know about her is that she practiced emergency medicine for 10 years uh, when she saw and treated a broad spectrum of human health and illness. Now she works with her skincare brand to improve people's health and happiness, as well as the planet's by decreasing the number of chemicals in our personal care routines and by encouraging us to return to our senses. If you are into green beauty, fitness, border collies, Colorado, or healthy living, you should stalk her Instagram feed and you can find her at Osmia, that's O-S-M-I-A Organics. Thank you so much for being with us, Sarah. Thank you for having me. So we always start off with this exercise where you close your eyes and go back to a time in your childhood when you played around flowers or plants or trees. Okay. And think about what you were doing, who you were with, what you were up to. See if you can identify a favorite flower or botanical. I can. Then reflect about the three words you would use to describe its personality. And whenever you're ready, you can just share everything you're thinking about with us. Sure. Um, So I lived in the same house in Washington, D.C. for 18 years growing up. And there was a massive dogwood tree in the front yard. And when those little pink flowers would come out, it was just like this magical time of year. And it's not really a flower that has much of a scent, but... I think the words that come to mind are hopeful because they would come out in the spring and it was really this time of blooming. Elegant because the color of it is just, it's like barely there, you know, but then you kind of go in and really inspect it and it's got this beautiful blush to it, like a veil or a chiffon scarf or something. And then I think the last idea would be that they're surprisingly sturdy. Like for as delicate and beautiful as they look, when you actually get to the petals of a dogwood flower, they're they're thick and fat and strong. Mm-hmm. So, you wouldn't think right with such a pale blush, soft. Yeah, I thought it was such an interesting combination to have such a such a feminine and delicate looking flower, but it in in your hands it was sturdy. Mm. I love that. So what we find is that the way you describe your childhood favorite typically would describe the way that you bring your gifts into the world. So hopeful, elegant, feminine, and delicate, yet surprisingly sturdy. Hmm. Does that sound interesting? Like <laughs> it kind of does, actually. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so funny because I we met we've met over the years at different beauty events. Mm-hmm. Uh, from both of our businesses and I actually didn't know until today that you were an ER doctor what yeah I know right you did you know that they do you know and and I, it's funny because I live in a really small town now I live in a town of you know 7,000 people in the mountains of Colorado so the medical community here is really tightly knit and so um, you know even though I haven't been in the ER since 2011 you know, I still am sort of part of the medical community in town, which is really a lovely treat um, to be able to kind of bridge that medical, non-medical world. 
Yeah, I don't. It's funny because when I started the company, my husband was like, you should wear the white coat and the stethoscope on the website. And I was like, <laughs> yuck, I don't want to do that at all. You know? <laughs> I didn't do that when I went into patients' rooms in the ER. I would just say, hey, I'm Sarah. You know, what can I do for you today? And that formal piece of being an MD has never really resonated with me. But I also do think I have, you know, a wealth of information and experience that contributes to you know, the development of our products and more importantly to the ways in which I can try to empower people when it comes to their own health. And so, you know, I still keep the MD out there so that people know I have that training, but I'm not really one to kind of, you know, bring it into the room with a a megaphone. (laughs) (laughs) And how did you get from being an ER doctor to owning your own skincare brand? I think that's so interesting. Like what how, what was um what was on that road and what how, what made you pull the trigger to do your own your own business? Yeah, it was a bumpy, twisty road with lots of tangled branches and strange <laughs> creatures on it, it's like a <laughs> Wizard of Oz scene or something. So I guess you know in in medical school and then in my training, there was so much I loved about medicine you know, meeting people and the intuitive element of medicine came very naturally to me where I could sort of sense pretty quickly whether something was truly wrong with someone or whether, you know, the problem was perceived or had to do with something other than their their physical well-being. And so I loved that piece of it. And like I said, connecting with other human beings and their stories and finding ways to help them. But I ended up choosing emergency medicine because I would do a rotation in like OB and I'd be like, okay, that was fun, but I don't want to do only that. And same with peds and same with surgery and sort of, I liked everything, but I didn't want to limit myself to any of it. So I ended up in the ER thinking, okay, well, Mm -hmm. I get to see a little of everything. It's shift work. And I, you know, at that point I was sort of thinking I might have kids one day and I thought, okay, if I work shifts, maybe I can go home. And when I'm home, I'll be home, you know? So, you know, I ended up in the ER because of that. The problem, and it's not just a problem that's in the emergency room, but it's really an epidemic within, within Western medicine is that the system is just really broken and it ends up putting you as a provider in handcuffs. So, you know, for me, in the ER, especially the nurses would just get so mad at me when I would try to talk to, you know, a patient who had sprained his ankle about smoking cessation. Because they're like, Sarah, he's an ankle sprain. Like, let's go, you know? And I'm like, but he smokes. Uh, We have to talk about that because I'm a doctor and I can help him (laughs) think about quitting, you know? And I would talk about lavender essential oil for use in an elderly patient's evening routine, you know, could you add some smell in, you know, and they're like, just give the guy a script for Xanax and let's, let's move through this. And holistic, Sarah. (laughs) I was too holistic. (laughs) Yes. For the ER. And eventually it started to feel bad. You know, Mm -hmm. I started to think this is, this is silly the way we're doing this. You know, I mean, nobody's asking these people what they're eating. No one's talking to them about stress management. No one's asking them if they are committed to their own health, right? So that's all like percolating. And then I had a second daughter and I was living out here in Colorado by then. And then when she was three months old, my mom, who was 64, died of pancreatic cancer. And it was a brutal like decline and death. And she was healthy and lovely and beautiful and now dead. And, you know, I was in the room when she died. My head was on her chest, like when her heart stopped beating. And my little three-month-old was two rooms over. And at that exact moment that I heard my mom's last heartbeat, my baby woke up and started crying. And there was this interesting feeling. And I'm not and sort of an active believer in other lives, but I'm not a disbeliever either. I'm just kind of like, I don't, I don't understand it. But that moment was very clear that something had shifted or passed or uh, there was just this unbelievable energy movement in the house when that happened. And and really what happened was three generations of women were all together and time sort of like 
imploded and exploded all at once for me. And it made me see how short the timeline of our lives is. And so I thought, you know, maybe not in that moment, but over the following months, as I was grieving the loss of my best friend, I thought like, gosh, you know, if I'm not doing something that doesn't, that, I mean, I, I just wasn't able to spread my wings. So I started thinking like, how, how could I do this differently? So that's sort of roughly where things were when I took a class making soap and had a very unexpected light switch, like, oh my God, moment where I thought, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And then it was like, okay, so I'm going to go home to my husband and be like, um, so I'm like not going to be a doctor anymore, but I'm going to make soap now. <laughs> and that was a really tough thing to figure out. But, you know, I did some a lot of soul searching about, you know, my ego and what it was about medicine that I didn't want to let go of and what it was about medicine that I loved and how could I get creative about bringing what I loved about medicine into a totally different shape. And that's really, you know, what I hope that we do with Osmia. Mm. Oh my God, I love it. So like I said, it was like a touchy road. It's a really touchy yeah. story. Wow. And so, so then what? You just like quit? And <laughs> no, husband, so got on board and you started <laughs> making soap. Like so, kind of. I mean, so my husband knows me well enough to know that, you know, like I'm I'm sort of a border collie stuck in a human body, and like when I like set my eyes on the ball. Oh, you're, you're like, not, that's it. Like, there's no gonna question. going to distract me. Yeah. Yeah. So he at first kind of laughed and he was like, oh, you're serious. And I was like, I, I kind of am. So I have a friend who is a veterinarian and she had taken the class with me and her kid was grown up and moved out of the house. So we took this storage room in her house and we converted it into what we jokingly called the meth lab for <laughs> uh, like two years. <laughs> <laughs> but I did sort of like a clean version of Walter White where I like just sat there with giant goggles on for two years and tried <laughs> every natural plant-based concoction and combination known or not known to woman. Yeah, so for two years I did that and developed products and and then finally felt, you know, had that moment where I thought if I'm going to keep one foot in medicine and one foot in this, neither will ever go. So you have to decide Wait. yeah so you oh, so were I was working shifts were, in ER were, that whole time okay so mm -hmm. shifts in ER and then going to the mm -hmm. meth lab <laughs> exactly exactly okay. and then like nursing babies in between right <laughs> oh my god <laughs> yeah so and then I, I thought like what would I you know and again I I've never had a moment where I felt like my mom was like clearly in the room with me or any of that sort of paranormal stuff that I like have craved you know of course I wish I could like somehow contact her again but as close as I've come is when I was trying to make that decision about leaving medicine. And I had to ask myself, what would your, my mom was a, like a super high powered partner in a law firm in DC and was wow. very, very career oriented at a time when, you know, women really, you know, had to work well more than men to become partners and to become successful partners. And so I thought, what would she say? And I could hear, I, I could hear her voice say, honey, do what you love. And so I was like, okay, that's it. I'm doing it. So, and my husband has been what I would say is irrationally supportive of me from the beginning. Like he has <laughs> no reason to be as supportive of me as he has been, but he's just been totally on board the whole time. So how awesome is that? I'm very awesome lucky. Yeah. That? It's, it's, it's amazing. He's my number one fan. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. And then and then you just jumped off the ER ship and started making mm -hmm. bars of soap. Yeah. I mean, it basically, you know, we we rented a space in town and at the time we had this amazing woman Monica working for us, this Hungarian woman and she had been our nanny for 5 years. And wow. she said she started having kids of her own and she was like okay I wipe noses and butts at work and then I go home and I wipe noses and butts there and I 
think I want to try something new. I was like, <laughs> great, because I want to start a company and I want you to be the person to do it with me. So she's been our production manager since day one. And I sort of taught her how to make all the products. And then she figured out how to do it better than I ever had. And wow. so she's still with us now, um, seven years in, and she's, you know, manages our production department. And we still, at this point, we still make every product in house, which mm-hmm. is a lot of product um, mm-hmm. to make by hand, but, and probably not the most, like in terms of, um, you know, business growth, not a good idea. So for those of you entrepreneurial sorts who might be know. listening today, <laughs> okay, I but uh, we, we I guess I should everything. qualify it. I should qualify it. We have like 55 SKUs or something like that. And we, we started with like 30. So I think I would just say start small and, and then grow. But yeah, it's been an interesting path. I mean, it, you have to be happy with a slower growth path than you would if you picked you know, two products to manufacture and outsourced them and, you know, really exploded. But. You know what the benefit of that though is, is it's more creative. It's more hands-on. You can have variety. You can have all kinds of things. You can test it. You can R and D it. You can, you know, if you oh go God, to, it's awesome. You go, I totally I, agree. I have a, a, a friend who has a company and she isn't making by hand. She's outsourcing to contract manufacturers and it's like the lab fees and the, I mean, it's like, like thousands of dollars for a little sample. And I'm like, Oh mm-hmm. God, we could have just whipped that for you up for you yeah. in minutes, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you get to like, it's hard. You definitely get both to... sides of the story. I mean, some, you know, I know some people who have stuff manufactured and they think it's like, you know, so much better than when they were doing it themselves. You know, for me, I still, I still struggle. And I think it's just, again, because I'm like a total control freak that like, you know, (laughs) when, when Monica comes to me and says, smell this chamomile, like there's something wrong. And I smell it. I'm like, yeah, that is not normal. Like, let's, let's send it back. We won't produce this product until we get it right. And that's what I have trouble letting go of is that ability to control Mm -hmm. the quality of the line so precisely, you know, with my own nose. That's really valuable to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> mm. So seven years in. So what have been some of your your biggest, I don't know, challenges or lessons or I just thought it'd be interesting to talk about business. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I I know so many people, I get a lot, I'm sure you do too, get a lot of questions from people about starting a business and, you know, how to go to go about it and what what's required. And I guess, you know, I'm I'm a little hesitant to say like, oh, if you want to start a business, just go for it. You know, like I I kind of want to have like a little reality check with people at the beginning. It's hard, you know, and people are like, oh, it must be so nice not to be working in the emergency room anymore. Now you get to spend time with your daughters. And and I'm like, oh, and so you're not a business owner. (laughs) That's what I know about you from that brief conversation. (laughs) Because frankly, I'm working harder now than I ever did in medicine, you know, and I'm responsible for 15 people's salaries and healthcare plans and insurance and, you know, like days off and all of the, I want to make a great job for those, those people too, you know, so it's not really as much about the profitability of the company as it is about building a really amazing place to be and creating products that we want to share with the world. But I think as far as challenges, like I think the one thing that I wish I had done a little differently was to trust myself more. I find, and I I don't know if this is like a woman thing or if it's just the way I'm wired or if it's my Enneagram points or what it is, but it's like, I I doubt myself a lot. And, you know, I find myself saying things like, well, I I don't know anything about business. I'm a doctor. I don't have an MBA. I have an MBA. You're not still saying that, right? Well, I mean, like in, I have to, I have to like whack-a-mole those thoughts every day, you know, because obviously I do know something about business because I've grown one and it's healthy and we're, you know, we're growing. And for your team is 15, right? We have 15. Yeah. That's, I think we have is, like 12 or 13 full time. And then we have a couple part time people. That is amazing. It's yeah, awesome. No and I have, I have, I have the best team ever. I mean, it's such a cool group of people. I just feel so blessed and lucky to spend time with them and to get ideas from them and to, you know, share a, a path of figuring out how to grow this thing. 
Um, but I think like what I didn't trust is that my instinct, which guided me in the emergency room really well. And, you know, that was another problem I had with medicine is, is the trend at the time was certainly in, into the evidence-based medicine was like the thing, right? So like if there wasn't a study to support it, then you couldn't order the CT scan. Whereas I was like a gut-based practitioner. So I'd walk in a room and I'd be like, I don't know why I know this, but I know something's wrong with this person and I'm going to dig until I figure out what it is. And that's the type of medicine that made sense to me. And so, you know, as a business person, I failed in the beginning to trust my instincts on a couple of things where whether it was a personnel issue where I had somebody that was just not aligned with the business and I, I knew it. You know, but I kept trying to give more opportunity or give more rope or whatever it was. Like, how can I, how can I pave the way for this person to succeed here? Even though my gut has like clearly spoken on the issue, I didn't trust that. I mean, did you do that too at the beginning? Where oh you like God. had? Yeah, it just. I, I think that's the hardest thing, and I don't know if it's it, it's if it's everybody, if it's women, if it's it's like the business of working with people. It's just really mm-hmm. damn hard to like let people go. It's hard. It's, it's hard horrible. Time. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, you know, that piece or whether there was like a, an opportunity that came up where I felt compelled because, wow, someone's going to sign up for, you know, at the beginning, a couple hundred of something. Oh my God, that's amazing. But, you know, it turns out it's some fitness superstar who like never acknowledges you after you've kept your team late nights for a week getting things ready and they don't even say thank you and and like I knew that I knew that this person wasn't aligned with our brand you know but I like I wanted to succeed or I wanted to take the opportunity or not miss the boat or whatever it was so I think cultivating that trust of your own instincts I mean it's it's my business no one, it's just like, no one knows it anywhere near as well as I do. So why would I doubt myself, you know? And I think that's a, that's a tough lesson for a lot of us to learn at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Luckily you get lots of opportunities. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Luckily it's not just like one and then everything goes down the tubes. It's like we get, oh, for sure. we get tons of opportunities to try to yep. refine. <laughs> I don't know yep. about you, but I feel so my business for me is like an extension of my spiritual path. And I, you know, I don't know if every business owner would say this, but Mm -hmm. I genuinely believe that like any trip ups or hang ups or things that are difficult for me personally will show up in my business for me Mm -hmm. to look at and deal with and evolve through, you know, and if I don't, it's going to hurt the business. Um, And it's like, Mm -hmm the faster that I can evolve, the faster that the business can evolve. Mm -hmm. And it's this like amazing kind of alchemy of, of situations that force me to grow in a sense. Do you find that with your business? Oh God. Yeah. That's really well put actually. I mean, I think, you know, like I mentioned, I have these, I have an ebbing and flowing wave of self doubt that lives in me and I have to work to, sort of keep it in a healthy place. I'd love to see it like fade away forever, but I'm not sure that that will happen for me. But I've had several times now where, you know, something has happened, you know, a couple of years ago, my director of operations left and it was a pretty stressful parting. It was one that really needed to happen, but, you know, left at the holiday season when, you know, it's just peak everything. And it's one of those, times where you kind of feel like the world is going to fall apart until you just say, actually, I'm just going to pick up this foot and I'm going to move it forward and I'm going to put it down like, like a foot bef- like in front of me. And then I'm going to do that again with the other leg and I'm going to keep doing that. And then I'm going to look up and I'm going to realize like, I'm, I'm running the company myself. And yeah, I was like, there were, there were a lot of nights where, and I know you've had these too, where you're 
I'm like feeling like the, the American Express small business like hidden camera is somewhere in my building as I'm <laughs> sitting on the floor, like covered in labels and stickers and, you know, <laughs> making boxes for shipping the next day at one in the morning, you know, but the fact is I needed to do it. And so I did it. And those are those learning moments where, and for me, it really taught me that, you know, you don't want to say this <laughs> in the wrong way because I need my team dearly and I love the team that I have. But the fact is that the, you know, the only person who isn't potentially replaceable in the business is me. Um, and I don't want to replace any of my awesome, awesome people, but if life shifts, you know, and they have to go, it shouldn't like invoke panic. You know, I just kind of realize, okay, that means that our paths are, are separating and I'll pick up the slack until I find the next right person, you know? Tough. So, yeah. Yeah. But I, I totally think you're right on about how you're, I mean, I always say Osme is my third daughter and <laughs> my husband actually wanted to have a third child. He said, I have two girls and he said, let's, let's try for a boy. And I was like, okay, how? And then that ended that conversation. So um, <laughs> we ended up having Osmia instead. And so, you know, I think it does, just like your children. Like for me and my children, because I, I try to be open to it, they, they show me my flaws and they show me the areas where I'm, I'm failing or, you know, areas of challenge if you want to be a little gentler about it. You know, places, opportunities for growth in the most optimistic light you know those moments when I really feel like the mother of the year award has like totally slipped past me I try to think wow this is an opportunity for growth isn't it um, <laughs> and it is it really is and the same is true of of our businesses they can really show us where we can grow <laughs> that's funny <laughs> so I was trying to think of like what would be the most helpful what should we talk about I mean, I think that my, like, that shouldn't surprise you to know that I have a soapbox I like to get on. Ooh, get on your soapbox. Being box, the soap please. maker that I am. Yeah, get on the soapbox. But, box. yeah, I think about, I guess, you know, for, for me, because I'm a physician who somehow ended up in the beauty industry, I feel a little out of place, you know? And I guess I would say, you know, Osme is more, I like to call it a health style brand, and so, you know, there's, we make products that are for your skin and for your senses, but really it's, you know, it's a brand that's about empowering people toward their own health. And so for me, the beauty industry has always, it's like I walked into the wrong room. I'm like, what, what is going on here? Like, I, I don't understand it. And, you know, it's sort of dangerous for me not to promise people that our products are going to make them look 20 years younger or you know, to sort of constantly talk about how we can, how we can anti-aging this or, you know, whatever I, that language is just not, it's so unappealing to me, mm -hmm. but I, I'm craving like a, a shift. And I, I think, you know, that's, how can we make, help make that shift for people? That's so funny because <clears throat> when I first got into the, well, I mean, I, I essentially realized that the spa industry was going to be the best sort of gateway for us to go through having uh -huh. a flower essences, you know, something that not everybody understood. And, you know, in the beginning, you go to the trade shows and God, I was so relieved when I found Green Spa Network because mm -hmm, it was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I found my people because until that yeah, point, yeah. I was going to all these trade shows that it was like, I just didn't even know how to dress. It was like, I don't paint my oh. fingernails. I don't mm -hmm. wear high heels. I yep. don't have like a suit skirts. Like I was yeah. just like, I yeah. don't fit in here. How am I going <laughs> to? Yeah. Oh, I totally, totally get it. I had that. <laughs> when I went to a packaging trade show and I, I like obsess about our packaging as much as I obsess about our ingredients and how to be, I hate the word eco-friendly because like the only thing eco-friendly is like an apple. <laughs> that doesn't have any pack. That's an eco-friendly packaging situation. Everything else is not friendly, but if it can be conscious, right, that's the goal. And so I would go to these packaging trade shows and these guys in like bad, bad suits would come up to me and say like, 
<laughs> you know, tell me about your business and, you know, what are you looking for? And I would tell them a little bit about Osmia. And then they would say, well, look, well why don't you come and take a look over here? This is great if you want to tell the green story. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to tell a green story. I want to do a green thing. So if this isn't doing something that is as environmentally considerate as possible, then I don't want to have any more conversation with you. But it was like they couldn't comprehend that I wasn't just there to tell a story, you know, or to, yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. market yeah. something or sell something or I don't know. I, I saw a little of that too, like the, 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 you know, like with the flower essences, we worked with one particular property and it was like, yeah, there was that kind of vibe of like using a flower to tell a marketing story. And we're like, no, 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 really. Like the flower essences are transformative. Like people mm -hmm. come in and they feel a difference. That's why we do right. it. It's not a right. story. Yeah. It's not a story. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think for me that, you know, the real trouble comes with the, the story that our, is it our culture? I don't know if it's, I don't think it's an American thing really. I think it's broader than that, but the story that we all been taught to tell ourselves about about appearance and aging, and it's such a faulty story. It's really deep, and it's it's hard. You know, I think about you know for the people who follow me on Instagram, they they know that I I sort of I stopped coloring my hair like a year and a half ago, and I think about why I started, and I think the reason I started was because. I didn't really think that there was, I thought that's just what you did. And I'm a pretty thoughtful, aware person, but like the stylist, you know, I think I was probably, I'm 45 now. So I was probably 38 at the time when I started seeing a few grays and the stylist said, do you want me to blend the grays? And I was like, uh, sh yeah, sure, sure. And then, you know, just shy of my 44th birthday, I find that, I'm like looking in the mirror at gray roots and having just had a hair appointment three weeks earlier. And I'm in like full freak out mode because my gray is showing. I mean, it's not like a boob is hanging out in the middle of a busy street, right? <laughs> it's just my hair color, right. right? I mean, and I, and I like had this moment where I was like, why am I ashamed of gray root? This is the color that my hair is. Like, it's like being ashamed of your skin color. It's just so silly. And so that started this sort of, you know, decision that I was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to take these shackles off now. Um, and it's not like I'm saying anyone who colors hair doesn't, hasn't seen the light. I'm just saying it should, you know, not coloring should be an equally viable option that the stylist at 38 should have said, have you thought about whether you want to let your silvers sparkle like the little treasures of wisdom that they are, or would you rather keep your hair closer to the color it is now? But that conversation didn't happen. It almost seems like even just on a practical <clears throat> level, there would be a, you know, like nature is always very good about natural transitions. So like, mm -hmm. you right. get one and then you get two and you get three and five and 10 and 20 grays. Totally. And then over you know how many years later you're you look mm -hmm. back at a photo and you're like oh wow yeah my hair changed color versus if you dye it for 10 years and oh like, I would do anything like, to go back and oh. never start yeah because growing it out just looks it's awkward it's like those yeah. first few months when you're pregnant and people are kind of like sneaking peeks at your belly like has she been like hitting the Budweiser or what's going on but before <laughs> you're obviously pregnant <laughs> now I have enough gray that it's it's a clearly a conscious like I'm not coloring my hair thing but for a while it just looks like I forgot to go <laughs> you know well even just for the, for your own <clears throat> transition like otherwise if we're dying then we're going from very rich color into fully mm -hmm. gray with mm -hmm. no transition <clears throat> right for ourselves in a period of a year or two and I think for me my so my mom when when I flew back east my my stepdad called and said I think you need to come home and I flew back with my brother and my baby and we walked into her room and she had 
you know, been through um, radiation and chemo and all that, and her hair fell out, and then it was, it had grown back like, I don't know, an inch, not even an inch, and it was all salt and pepper, and she was, I mean, quite literally on her deathbed, and she looked at us, and she tried so hard to stay awake all day to see us, and she said, you've waited a long time to see me with gray hair, and I thought, I can't believe this woman is still feeling like she needs to apologize for having salt and pepper hair on her deathbed. Wow. And that made me just think like this system is so, so messed up. And we, you know, I, I do this exercise when I speak at events and stuff where I have people kind of like you did with me before we started today, I have them close their eyes and I have them think of somebody important to them. And, you know, whether it's somebody who's still here or somebody who's passed or somebody who lives far away, but someone who's really touched their life in a meaningful way. And I have them try to picture one or two specific moments with that person. And then I ask them to open their eyes and I say, I'd like you to raise your hand if you thought about that person's crow's, crow's feet. And there's no hands raised. And I say, how about if you thought about like their jiggly underarm flab? Did you think about that? <clears throat> and they're like, no. And, um, oh, you know, the same for, for silver hair, right? Like, no, the, the, no, no, it's never important. So why do we spend time in the mirror just absolutely destroying ourselves with these kinds of criticisms and observations? when what matters is whether you've acted beautifully, right? I mean, oh. you remember the people who took you to chemo. You remember the people who showed up to help you bury your dog, you know? Um, those are, that's what you remember. And that's what we're here to do in this life. And do you, yeah, can we like judge ourselves a little here and there in the process to try to kind of look saucy from time? Of course, you know, I want to, <laughs> I want to look and feel beautiful too. I get it. <laughs> but, you know, I see these women who are, I mean, just shy of mutilating their faces mm. in an effort. And especially like, you know, I live near Aspen. So there's a, a lot of, you know, that community. And, and again, I'm, I'm really not trying to be judgmental or to shame people who make that decision but what it does is it makes my heart hurt because I just think what what are they seeking in that what feels like a desperate attempt and what they're seeking is to stop aging and you know it's such a fear-based decision and for me it's like what if what if we were terrified of breathing oxygen it's like the one thing that all of us do every day, we breathe oxygen and, and we also, we get older every day. And if we walked around in fear of inhaling oxygen every second, mm. like, you know, and, but that's what we're doing when it comes to aging. And then having seen my beautiful mom dead at 64, I'm like so clearly aware of the privilege that it is to get older. And how many people would love to have had it? So I just, that's my like thing. How can we like pull people's heads out of the place that they're in and just have them take a deep breath and figure out like what, what really matters and who am I doing this for? And if you are doing your beauty care rituals for yourself, because it truly makes you feel that you are a better human being because you do it. And you should keep doing it. But if you're doing it because you feel like it will make you look more like your old self or like your, you know, beautiful friends or you're like your husband won't love you if you don't do it or whatever it is, I feel like those are some pretty big questions that and that needs a big shakeup in my view. How do you personally adjust to the process of aging? I mean, I do it too, right? I mean, I look in the mirror and I see, you know, hyperpigmentation that people like to call age spots, but it's really just sun damage. And I see that I have some fine lines around my eyes 
and I see all this silver that's coming in. And that's just above the neck, sister. I mean, there's other stuff happening too. It's like not pretty, you know, having kids, things are in different places. And yeah, that's just, but I just, I just kind of like splash virtual cold water on myself when I start going down that road. And I think, well, okay, yeah, those things are all true. But the other thing that's true is that, you know, my 15 year old daughter could come and she can talk to me about absolutely anything with deep comfort. She can talk to me about, you know, about sex, drugs, rock and roll, school, emotions, whatever it is. I'm right there. And I'm ready with an open heart to talk to her. And actually, that matters. But the wrinkles don't. So I'm not saying, you know, people need to let themselves go. I mean, I'm out, I'm a fitness, like, freak show I'm out doing stuff all day every day constantly so I don't think we should let ourselves go but I think we should let ourselves be otherwise it's fighting a losing battle I mean the only it's kind of like the only way is acceptance I mean it's it's you know I I find myself talking a lot about this but death is a reality for every single Mm -hmm. one of us that's a conversation that's even harder to have than aging for most Mm -hmm. people Mm -hmm. the the fact that our time is so limited and that all of us will die and that all of us are aging but yeah you know it's it's just interesting as you get older I look at friends of mine who are you know 15 20 years older than me Mm -hmm. and I don't know I sometimes think that if people are evolving they actually look more attractive as they get older, Mm -hmm. even with the physical changes Mm -hmm. of gravity. They look, I don't know. I just, I look at pictures from 20 years ago and say, but actually, yeah, you look younger in those pictures, but I actually like how you look better now because you evolved into like a juicier, spicier Mm -hmm. being. Yeah. I totally get that. I totally get that. And I, I see pictures of myself where I'm like, full on like open mouth laughing and I think well that's why I have smile lines because I do that a lot you know and we just we do have such a limited time here and I don't want to live it in fear and I don't want to live it according to someone else's rules and if that means that some people think I look older or I'm not as pretty that's okay You know, that's okay. And of course, we use like ridiculously beautiful ingredients in our line that all have antioxidant activity and anti-inflammatory activity. I mean, it's all the good stuff. I'm just not willing to market it to people as anti-aging because I think that that just contributes to the big bad picture of the beauty industry. So instead, I just focus on what's incredibly pro about our line you know that it's like makes you feel amazing and it makes your skin feel soft and that your skin is glowy and that your senses are just heightened and alive and inspired by the products all that is enough you know in my mind to make you want to try it it doesn't have to promise you know the fountain of youth Well, in the end, I think you really just want to feel beautiful, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. My secret is I just don't look in the mirror very much. (laughs) (laughs) I don't either. I know. I I go weeks forward without seeing my makeup bag. I'm like, I think my daughter stole my makeup bag like a month ago. I have no idea where it is. So, (laughs) well. (laughs) Yeah, I have a secret belief that if you don't wear makeup, you like retain your skin's natural, you know, elasticity yeah. longer. Yeah, I actually, I, I kind of agree with you. I think that it's, I, and I've actually seen it a lot in, you know, friends who have, you know, worn a lot of makeup over the years and those who, who haven't. And I think it just is a, your skin sort of is a little stronger and a little healthier when you are piling less stuff on it. I mean, there's definitely better options now when it comes to clean makeup. So, right. you know, people have, have healthier choices to make. Um, but yeah, the whole, the whole, you know, beauty and aging thing is such a huge 
huge conversation. And I think it's a delicate one because, you know, you want to inspire people to try to shift their own thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a scary shift to make, you know, it really is. I mean, even just like my gray hair thing, like I, I obsessed over the decision and now I look back and I'm like, what was I like even worried about? It's fine. It's great. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if people could step out of what they believe and the sort of the rote things that they do every day and just, again, like ask, why do I do this? And do I want to continue to do it? And then go forward with that kit of things that you really do want to continue to do because it makes you really feel the like the best version of yourself. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just hard. You know, it's, it, there is a resistance to change. There's a ton of fear around it. I don't want to come off as like this, you know, anti-Botox earth mama. Like if Botox is going to make you feel right, you know, do it totally. You know, I do think there's like, <laughs> there's some stuff happening now that Botox has been around for like well, there's health remedies. Know, 20 or 30 years, there's potential health stuff. But yeah. for me, what I see, you know, when you don't, so Botox is a paralytic, right? So when you don't use a muscle, what happens to it? It loosens, weakens. It, it atrophies, right? It yeah. Sh yeah. literally shrinks in size. Yeah. And so then, you know, you have Botox, which came along I'm, I'm roughly 30 years ago, or maybe a little more. And then it, you know, 20 years of people using Botox for anti-aging solutions, all of a sudden, all of their facial muscles, because they're not being used, have atrophied. And now we have fillers explode onto the scene, right? Which are filling up the saggy places that have been created by the muscles that have atrophied from Botox use. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's always really dangerous to, to get into that. Um, slippery slope. Thing. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. And, you know, I think that's why a lot of these people have gotten into situations where they they've lost some pers perspective. Like when they look in the mirror, they're looking at the face they've been seeing for the last four or five years. But if they kind of looked back, they're like, what, they would be shocked to see that their face isn't even really the same person. You know, it's like, a, it's, I would never be able to know that it was the same person, you know? Wow. Wow. And that just feels, I don't know. That feels a little sad to me. Yeah, and regardless of, you know, procedures or processes or products or anything, I mean, I think mm -hmm. if you, if you are human, at some point in time, you'll look at photos and go, oh, shoot. Like, <laughs> I, I, like just in, the, in the last few years, I've had those conversations because the women, oftentimes the women on my team, or a great majority of them are, you know, 10 or more years younger than me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I, so <laughs> in the last few years, it's like, oh, yeah, that aging thing. Oh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. where it comes in. Okay, it's real. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. because you just start seeing, how your body's changing mm -hmm. um, or like, you know, posting a selfie or whatever. The, all of those things are kind mm -hmm. of triggering and to get to a point where you're, you have some perspective and can just say like, who cares? Right. Who cares? Like, right. I love the way you put it. This is like coming from your, your human self, the part of you that is memorable, the part that is, you know, what people remember you for versus. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's acting beautiful. I mean, it really is because you can look as gorgeous as you want, but if you are not behaving in a way that makes the world a better place, it really doesn't matter what you look like. Yep. <laughs> totally. 100%. So, and then the other thing, of course, is that if you are behaving like on, you know, days where I feel really connected with my girls or my husband or take a gorgeous long walk in the woods with my puppies or whatever it is I feel like I'm sort of like emitting beauty you know like it's coming from this you know cylinder inside of me and and that it's going to come out whether I try or not you know and and I, that, I didn't mean to, that to sound like I think I'm so beautiful, but I do feel like you can you can radiate beauty in a way that's totally not connected to what you're wearing or not wearing or makeup or, you know, 
Right, right, right. So, and that that's a much deeper type of beauty to be able to share with the world. The ultimate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I remember seeing women in, you know, in Asia doing meditation practices and such and seeing women who were like in their 80s and they were, you know, doing mantras at their malas or um, <laughs> frustrations or, you know, walking around Buddhist stupas or, you know, and just being like, wow, like blown mm -hmm. away by the radiance. Mm -hmm. um, no amount of products we buy could can do that, right? It's like... <laughs> the inside out yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely so if we were to wrap up here and i were to ask you what's a piece of advice words of wisdom something you often find yourself telling people what would you share with us gosh i think it would be something around fear I like to, I have like one mantra that I use sometimes, which is stop fighting, start inviting. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we, you know, like even within the wellness industry, you're sort of like, oh, here's what I need to eat. And oh my God, this, this has a toxin in it. And, you know, <laughs> like I can't this and I have to stop that. And it's all this, it's this attitude of fighting off badness you know, whether it's wrinkles or, you know, negative people or what's this fending off defensive posture mm -hmm. where your shoulders are hunched forward and your hands are up by your head or your face and you're just, you know, you're in this defense mode. <laughs> the gluten, the dairy, the GMOs. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? Yeah, it's air. so much fear. <laughs> it's so much fear. And <clears throat> of course, as a doctor, I want people to educate themselves. But extreme behavior in any direction kind of isn't healthy, right? So if you turn into like a total stress case about your diet, you kind of like lost the game, you know, <laughs> like yeah, you're not creating health. Right. So instead, I try to get people to like bring their sternum forward and up and like their shoulders back and down and start inviting beauty and goodness into their lives. And my friend, I always love to repeat this because when she said it, it stopped me in my tracks. Joanne, one of the founders of Innersense Organic oh, yeah. Beauty, the hair care line. Yeah. Do you know Greg and Joanne? Yeah, they're awesome. They're so awesome. Joanne said to me one day in some random conversation, she said, well, I guess, you know, the question really is how good are you willing to have it? And I was like, whoa, I've never heard anyone say it like that before. Because we, I don't know, we just don't open ourselves up to, to the beauty. And there, there's a lot of conflict and there's a lot of negativity and there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of confusing information. I think that's a big piece for people is they hear, you know, they're on Instagram and they see that whatever, like kale is the superfood. And then it's like, no, kale's so out, you know, kale is hard to digest. You should be eating whatever it is. And so I think that that that's tricky for people to navigate. But I think, you know, again, when people get stressed about, well, which one do I believe? That's a fearful question. You sit and you open yourself up and you invite the answer. You invite like the goodness and whatever feels right to you and feels like it's creating health in your body and your mind is the right answer for you. And it might not be right for your sister, you know? So what? It's right for you. So trust that instinct. Trust what's right for you. Trust that you are the only expert on your own wellness, on your own health, your body, your mind, your spirit. You are the only inhabitant of those things, and you don't get to pay rent there very long. So, like, make it count and believe in what all of the gifts and the beauty that you have to offer the world. Go give them and, like, see how beautiful you become. That's what I would say to people. Mm. I love it. Thank it was a work in progress me. for all of us, right? I mean, there yeah, are days yeah. when it just doesn't happen and you're like, I'm fat and ugly and whatever and I need to pout for a little time. <laughs> we all do that too, you know? <laughs> but to have that as your as your point, like what are my gifts and what can I share? That's really 
the go-to piece. That's what counts and that's what makes yeah. us beautiful. Yeah. And you do an incredible job of it every day, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, every time I see your face, I'm like, oh, she just radiates all of the good things about life. So oh. I think you're a gift to all of us. Oh, I was going to say to you, thank you for giving your gifts. Yeah. Incredible company, incredible high integrity products. If you are interested in checking out all of the yummy, delicious <laughs> smelling healthy health style products check out osmiorganics.com that's o-s-m-i-a organics.com and also follow on instagram and yeah yeah it's 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 interesting because there are you know well when running a business spa beauty and dvd whatever industry it really nice to connect with other business owners and you I, I you know like we just cross paths every now and then but I always remember as you as like never a thread or an ounce of competition and just always super oh you know warm-hearted and open arms and yeah. it's memorable so thank you yeah of course I mean that's you know it's, we're all here to try to make things healthier for our fragile planet and for the course of human evolution. So if you're doing good things, then I support you, period. You know, whether you're my competition or not. Um, it's the, the point of, of Osmia, the point of Lotus Way is to make things better. So we should support each other. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So wishing you a gloriously prosperous 2019 at you Lotus too. Way. Yeah, good luck <laughs> with the new space. Thank you so much. I hope you can come visit soon. Yeah, same here. My my door's open in the mountains of Colorado. I'll take you Nordic skiing. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Katie. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.